For those of you that uh, don't know, I am uh, Sir John Johnson. I host Pina Comics on WESU here in Middletown. You can uh, check that out on the website, WESUFM.org. But tonight, you're not here to listen to me, as I have said before. This is uh, Don Glute and Rick Hoberg, and they're going to be talking animation, which is very cool. Welcome, guys. Thank you. <laughs> nice to see everybody. Well, uh, we're supposed to be talking about animation, yes. TV animation, most of which is terrible. Uh, but focusing on uh, okay. Spider-Man and his amazing friends because Rick and I worked on that show together. And Rick and I have known each other since we met. He illustrated one of my Tarzan comic book stories. And that's, and that's where our friendship began. And we worked on a number of projects after that, including um, the female Thor, which is getting a lot of uh, interest right now, and um, but other things. We worked on the dinosaur book, and we do uh, a lot of things. We we just have been friends all these years, many decades. Had parties at each other's houses and that sort of thing. But we're mainly going to talk about today about um, what it was like writing uh, and drawing, and storyboarding, and designing. Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Uh, anything you want to add to that before we? Um, no, that's that's pretty much correct. Except that you should know that uh, Thordis, that is the original version of Jane Foster as Thor, was created over uh, a pair of uh, my wife's uh, pina coladas. Because when worlds coladas, yeah, as yeah. we used to call them. <laughs> yeah, that that. Uh, we could talk a little about that because Thor, I used Thor in one of the Spider Friends cartoons. Yeah. Uh, I one, that one, yeah one, one thing to, uh, you know, I want to emphasize is Saturday morning animation shows, cartoon shows, were not comic books. And the people behind the scenes, the ones that were really calling the shots, were not comic book people. And they didn't know the comic books. And what Rick and I tried to do, we figured that the people watching that, sh anybody watching the show called Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends would want to, would watch it because they were fans of Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. So we tried to make those characters and those stories as close to the comics as we possibly could. And sometimes it was an uphill, uphill battle. Yeah, that was our mission, literally, was to get as many Marvel characters in and show that it was a connected universe, which mm -hmm. is kind of novel, because if, you, if you've read or know anything about like what DC had been doing for years, they went out of their way to keep Batman and Superman away from each other, except when they were selling a com comic book called World's Finest. And same thing with the rest of the heroes, where Marvel... Stan Lee, in particular, knew it was smart to interweave these characters, have Thor flying through in the background in a Spider-Man comic, so people would go, what's that guy Thor doing? Who is that? And they'd go off and buy, hopefully, buy a Thor comic book. Yeah, so and this the, was something we wanted to introduce. The, you know, one of the difficult things about doing that, or trying to do that, was uh, two things. One is, you know, most of the, I won't say most of, a, a lot, I, I can't remember how many writers were on the show, but a lot of the writers didn't have the same attitude I had. Uh, they were just writing sa standard sa Saturday, Saturday morning cartoons with the same plots you saw recycled over, you know, sp sp Spider-Man gets shrunk under the sides of, you know, sp Spider-Man Spider Spider -Man has an evil twin, you know, all the old cliche plots. And they didn't know the comics. And the other uphill battle was the story editor didn't know those characters. He didn't. I had to explain to him who Captain America was and who Submariner was Ouch. and who Kazar was. And, uh, you know, I, I remember um, I did a story with the Black Knight, and in the Marvel comics there were two Black Knights. There was the one that lived in King Arthur's time, and then there was the modern-day descendant of the Black Knight. And he said, oh, we're going to... And I, that's the way I wrote the script originally. So we're going to save some time in the script and save a little money. I'm going to combine them into one character. And um, I did the Thor one, where Thor is, uh, come, is flying through the air in this Viking ship with a crew of Viking sol soldiers. Oh, and none of them spoke, so it wasn't like hiring an actor to do a voiceover. <laughs> it was just pictures. 
and they were just standing there in a boat. They weren't doing anything, you know, they weren't shooting pool or something, you know, or playing a game or fishing or anything. They were just standing there, and he said, well, we can't afford all those Vikings. So I'm, I'm re reducing it to one. And the other thing was, he wanted to do a show about Ms. Lion, which I think both of us and everybody in this audience, if they have any brains, detested. Uh, the only thing I've really hated in the years I worked on those kind of cartoons was these so-called funny animals. You know, I'm a pet lover, but I wouldn't mind seeing any one of these dogs put down, you know, that was, they, especially Miss Lion. That was just a waste of time and effort, you know? And that was, we were forced to use that character as, as give her as much screen time as we could because the networks believed this will make the show appeal to the little girls and not just the little boys. And every time I would run one of those cartoons for one of my friends, I was embarrassed when that character came on with the little bows and all this. And I said, my God, who, you know, it was like, you know, a crossover with Ms. Line and Godzuki would have been <laughs> appropriate. Well, that's not a bad idea. Those were two of my first <laughs> cartoons that I worked on. Yeah, but does, does anybody have any uh, questions about how these shows were done or... Um, I'm sure there's a lot behind the scenes that nobody's ever aware of. I have a question for you, and that has to go with uh, standards and practices. How, how often did you have to deal with uh, S&P putting on a Saturday all, all morning cartoon? All the time. All the time. Yeah. They we always didn't had write, some yeah, we didn't, yeah. I didn't write those cartoons for the kids after a while. I was writing them for the censors, the network censors. I was once... <laughs> I couldn't have a character say the word atomic. <laughs> because that was considered violence. Well, we had the Captain America episode, and it was decided halfway through that we couldn't mention the name Nazis because it might offend somebody. And I'm like going, are you kidding me? Yeah, they couldn't do it. They, really? they, just, they, they couldn't call them Germans, couldn't call them Nazis, so they were just, you know, these guys with, these goose-stepping guys with... What about the violence? I mean, how did they handle that? They I, didn't want to see it. Right, yeah. so... I did the one with Kazar, and uh, it was... Uh, I think I had quicksand in it originally, and quicksand was considered violent, so I couldn't have quicksand. And I think an octopus it might have been considered violence at that time. But then the the thing that really it, it, it cost me a number of jobs because I was put on hold during this whole fiasco. The network wanted the origin of Spider-Man, but they didn't want Uncle Ben to die. And Stan said, Uncle Ben's got to die or you can't do Spider-Man. It's not Spider-Man unless, you know, it's like you can't do Batman without his parents getting killed. I mean, the origin. And he wanted me to write, the, he called me up personally, he wanted me to write the origin of Spider-Man. So they went back and forth for months, Stan and the network and the censors. How are we going to do this? And meanwhile, everybody else is getting all these jobs on the Hulk and everything. No, you, we want to. We we, we got to make sure that once this is resolved, you're ready to go, and we can't have you tied up on another show. So while everybody else is getting rich and I'm going broke, fighting with this network fight going on, I we finally figured out a way. And I, I wanted to go to the original comic books and use as many of those panels as I possibly could. Um, Again, I was trying to make them more like the comics. So we got, we got to the point where the network said this was okay, where, where Spider-Man runs into the cop, or Peter Parker runs into the cop, and he says, I got bad news for you. What? Your Uncle Ben. Is he? Yes. And that's the way it went. And then there was a shot, I think, of the burglar where he's supposed to be pulling a gun out, and all he does, he could do this but he couldn't take his hand out of and his shirt. And, and, he, and poor Rick had to draw all this stuff, you know, and figure it all out. And that's what, that's what we were up against. It was... Uh, it, it, it's, it, it goes back to the time in, uh, during the 60s where when Batman was on television, and Batman kind of ruined uh, things for a lot of us that wanted to see this stuff done more seriously because this, everybody saw superheroes as something to make fun of and something to satirize. And, you know, Batman had been a huge hit for the first year, so this is where they thought it would go. And on top of that, at the time that was happening, Hanna-Barbera in particular had a free reign on Saturday morning to make these really fun, violent, but fun shows like, uh, uh, what was it, Samson and uh, uh, the Herculoids mm -hmm. and uh, Shazam. I know a friend who had his Herculoids uh, taken Ghost out. And Space Ghost and stuff like that. And they... they uh, 
these incensed the censors so much that there was a huge pushback, and that's where all of these censorship things came up that were so ridiculous. You know, you couldn't mention this, couldn't do that. Careful, you don't have kids on the roof. They might try to fly and fall <laughs> off the roof. I mean, what, did that ever really happen? I don't think that ever really happened. The, the stupidest one to me was the human torch. They didn't want to do the human torch in the, first, in the second out, the second version of the Fantastic Four done on TV because kids might set themselves on fire. And I'm like going, really? <laughs> I, I never really thought that would be a good idea when I was a child. But Firestar was okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? And so there was all of these preconceived ideas that they made up to have jobs, in my opinion, because this was the kind of censorship that wasn't necessary at all. Yeah. I did a Tarzan one, Tarzan Lord of the Jungle, called The Beast in the Iron Mask. I've, I've written The Man in the Iron Mask at least seven or eight times in different media. Uh, but this was a, a Tarzan story, and the, the, the character with the mask was in a tower with a window with bars on it. And I had the guy, you know, people were taunting him, throwing vegetables like tomatoes and, you know, th things like that. It's, Sauerkraut, whatever. You probably had a good one. Yeah, and the and the, and the and the and the censor said that they can throw the um, the vegetables, but they can't come anywhere near the parameters of the window. <laughs> so these these were all bad shots, really bad. You know, their their marksmanship was like was like nothing. And then I had a um, triceratops, a griff as they call them. In, in Burroughs stories, uh, caught in a tar pit. And there was something about, or, or maybe he had a thorn in his, I can't remember what this, because it's not out on DVD and I haven't seen it in decades. But there was a whole thing about this triceratops feeling discomfort over this situation it was in. And Tarzan couldn't c carry a knife. He couldn't fight with the natives. He, uh, he was sort of, do acrobatics and dazzle them. They would all go, oh, and they would faint, you know, because they were so dazzled. And, and there was, uh, and I came in on, I think, the third season, and the, one of the, the restrictions was I couldn't use any black natives. And we had gone through every lost civilization you could imagine being in the jungle. I said, well, have you tried the Etruscans yet? <laughs> no, we haven't tried them, you know. And... Uh, it was, uh, it was a crazy world, that whole world of Saturday morning cartoons, what you couldn't do. And the kids thought we were doing them for them, but we were, we were trying to appeal to, you know, the, the Shazam panel, which is coming up right after this. They had a whole, if you look at the end credits, they had a whole board of children's uh, child psychologists in the credits who, who went through the shows to make sure there was nothing offensive about them. And I wrote one of those, and I had to go through the same, the same situation, and uh, never got on the second season because I made the stupid mistake of uh, telling the new story at her. I said, wouldn't it be great if we could have somebody shoot at him and the bullets bounce off his chest like Superman? That was it. I was like, I signed my own death warrant when I said that. <laughs> and I couldn't even get him on the phone after that. But, but. Um, but anyway, does anybody have any questions about these? The fun for us was getting to do all these characters. You know, we've, we've been. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, guys. Is this? Yep. Joe Stuber with Comic Book Central. I think I'm going to be helping you out on your 7 o'clock running the, uh, your movies. In case you guys don't know, it's 7 o'clock. Don's going to be showing in, movies, It will be in right? this room? They're going to be in this room. Yeah, hey, I'm going to run. You know, years ago yeah. before I got into this business, I, I had hobbies like most normal people. And one of them was making amateur movies, and I made a, about a half a dozen superhero movies with Superman and Captain America, and very, you know. And we're going to run those tonight. And if we don't, and there'll be a Q and A. And if we don't, if there's still time afterwards, I'm going to run my my real movie, my professional movie, the last one I made called Tales of Frankenstein, which is kind of a retro. Uh, Frankenstein movie with villages with torches and tr brain transplants. I even have a gorilla in it. And um, <laughs> was it an actual gorilla or a guy in a suit? <laughs> it's a guy in a suit, but it's a great suit. The same one that John Landis <laughs> used in his movie. Oh, <laughs> whatever that movie was, that he had the yeah. they had a gorilla in it. But anyway, it's Trading a good place. gorilla. And um, some actors you may know: Ann Robinson, Beverly Washburn, Jerry Lacey from uh, Dark Shadows. Uh, so I think you might like it if you like those old 
fashion universal and hammer films. His movies are really yeah. good. seven o'clock. Really it'll yeah. be in this room here. I get you mentioned the Captain America one. I got to ask you about that. Uh, and feel free to crash our Shazam panel. And yeah. <laughs> feel free to crash our Shazam panel. I got to ask you about 18 years after you did your Captain America and Red Skull film, you got to write one of the episodes of Spider-Man featuring those two characters. Were you able to use anything from your original film in that? And I also want you to talk about the Crime of All Centuries, the Craven the Hunter episode, where you sneaked a lot of cool dinosaur references and you almost had Ms. Lion eaten by a dinosaur. I'm, I'll hang up and listen now. Yeah, I, I, can somebody repeat that? I, I miss most of that. So uh, in the Captain America, uh, what was it? The Captain America... Uh, Captain America Red Skull? Red Skull. Uh, your film, did you use the film. For the, uh, animated did you use anything from the animated show in that film? In my amateur movie? Yeah. yeah. No, in Captain America Battles of the Red Skull. By the way, the Red Skull is played by Larry Ivy of Monsters and Heroes. Was fame. he really the voice on that? Uh, not the voice. Uh, the voice was done by somebody else. But the character in the suit, Larry had made these two suits. Well, I want to talk about that tonight. It's, I don't know, take up all the time now. But um, uh, This was in your movie, Larry. Was yeah, because that's what the whole focus of the 7 o'clock thing will be. But one thing I wanted to say, too, was, like I said, we were trying to make those spider Friend shows as uh, close to the comics as we possibly could. But a lot of the writers who, who were on that show had no idea what the comics were. And that's why you would get like a mini Spider-Man and uh, you know, stories that really were non-Marvel-like, I would say. But we yeah. had you and we had Christy Marks and there were people who really loved that stuff that turned out some nice stuff. Yeah, yeah. None of it was great because you know, we were at that point in animation where they just didn't want to pay to have anything moving. So that no. you would uh, have, you know, and, yeah, and, and they wouldn't retake anything. So. And Tarzan, when, when, when I got to go ahead to write the script, as I was leaving the office, they, they handed me two big binders. I said, what's that? Oh, those are the stock shots you've got to use. I said, what? Yeah, you've got to use to save money as many shots that are in this, you know, head turning to the right, head yep. turning to the left, close-ups of feet, you know, uh, Nakeem, the monkey going, ooh, you know, whatever. But don't call them stock shots in the script, because the network hates the use of stock shots, and they don't. We don't want them to know we're using stock shots. But the the people doing the storyboards, they'll know because they use them so many times before. So I wrote that whole script around. I think half the script came out of those two books. I mean, just the visuals, you know. Well, they had to. Was, yeah, it, was I that did the a filmation Lone series for them? And they. Uh, they literally got the, the board in. All the board guys were looking at it going, wow, that's a great board, Rick. And, and the, the, the lead guy on it, Will Minio, a good friend, said this is really w good stuff, but now you've got to take the whole thing and put it together using the stock that we've got. Rick, and it was just like, uh, this isn't what I signed on for. Yeah, <laughs> literally, well, I did what they asked and we, I quit. We signed the checks, though. Those are nice. Yeah, exactly. That was the best uh, art in the movies. Did you work on the... Uh, Spider-Man show right before Spider-Man. Yes, Friends. and that was very, very faithful. That, yeah, that was, was that Ruby Spears? No, no, that was that was Marvel, but it was. Uh, uh, you're not talking the the Bakshi show, right? The you're Bakshi show. Just, okay, well, what I'm talking about is when the Bakshi show. Remember Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Right. Yeah. That show, they were going to reissue it, re-release it to syndication, and they needed some more episodes, so they called uh, Dennis Marks and his story editor whose background was entirely in children's... And Art Vitello was the main director. Yeah. yeah. And, and then I came on that show, and I wrote, I think, four episodes. And I made them as close to the Marvel comics as I could. I did one with Captain America and the Red Skull the and Nazis. Was in one. Yeah, and it was... I based it on the tales of suspense stories that Jack Kirby and Stan Lee yeah, were doing in, in the back of the book, you know, with Iron Man in the front. And... Um, and then I did one with Submariner, and I brought in uh, Neymarita, and I brought in all the, all the Spider-Man gangster villains, <laughs> Silver Mane and all those, you know? And, they all, and, I, and I, in the script, I said, okay, this character should talk like James Cagney, because he reminds me of Cagney. This guy should be more like Humphrey Bogart. This guy should be more like Boris Karloff. And then I did one with Kazar, and then I did Arsenic and Old, uh, Arsenic and Nan May, which had, again, the retelling of the origin of Spider-Man. But those, we could get away with things. Well, I actually had J. J. Jonah Jameson smoking cigars oh, in there. Wow. 
Well, you know? that was going to be an, a, a syndicated show, not a, yeah, it was syndicated. Not a network show, so there was no network yeah. to deal with. It. Yeah, that one I had fun on. I mean, that, then I really, because I got away with so much things I couldn't do otherwise, you know. You could show guns. And when, uh, when it really changed, it was uh, G.I. Joe that, that totally flipped the script on all of this because uh, Hasbro had approached Marvel about doing a cartoon miniseries of G.I. Joe since they were redoing the character as small action figures now and not the dolls that we, we had during the 60s. And um, when we had the meetings with Hasbro, they told us we could do pretty much what we want. And I was like, with the rest of the guys going, so we can do fist fights and they can shoot at each other and stuff. And they went, oh yeah, that's what we're selling here. <laughs> so it was totally liberating. I mean, the first sequence I got on the first script was Scarlet beating up like five Cobra guys. And I just went to town on it. Everybody loved it. And that just right there started to change everything because not only was it fun and we all knew, saw that it was fun and it was being done really well. The animation is nice on these. But when it was shown this five episode miniseries, which had to be, the only deal that the syndicators had is that it had to be shown the same five days in a row, the same time every day, so that there was a time when children could plan to watch it and see the whole thing. And because they did that, it turned out to be the highest rated miniseries of the time, just behind Roots. And that <laughs> was a stunner for all of us. And immediately Hasbro said, We'll buy a whole season of this. And they went on to do five seasons, I think, something like that. And uh, it, it led to other shows. I mean, you can literally see the arc from that to um, X-Men, the animated series, and Batman, and what, what they were doing in those things. It just really helped us all, you know, get out from under that stuff. And pretty soon there was no more standards and practices. I mean, they just didn't, they existed, but they weren't telling anybody what to do anymore. And knowing is half the battle. Yep, exactly. Did you guys was work that, on those too? Duke is your was that your imitation of Duke? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Well, Michael Bell's here this, this weekend too. So well, I think the funniest uh, uh, censorship thing for my money was I did the final animation design for Firestar. I mean Firestar, and I, I was given the 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 nice drawings that John Romita did, and they just said give it a you know we need it to be more animation friendly. So it, it needed simplicity to begin with. Things like the, the wonderful hair that he would draw, that wouldn't animate. It just, there was nothing to do with it. So I turned it into stuff that looked like flames and stuff, and I gave her those things around her, her wrists, I mean, upper arms, and stuff that looked like they were the cuffs of gloves. And she became a pretty big hit, and I was able to do her as a really voluptuous, beautiful girl. And every season, the one biggest complaint by the networks is that, you no, know, her breasts are just, too large, you're gonna take oh, that down a little that, bit. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the buttocks, we've got them, we can't see the lines and stuff. So it went from having these really nice drawings of women to having, well, nothing there on anywhere in the, in the form, especially the, the, the rear end. You literally, it was just a line that was a semicircle at the top of two legs. And you know, that was all we, we could show at that point. Oh, that's funny. It's a disappointment for me. <laughs> <laughs> Firestar was created for that show, correct? Yeah. yeah. I love the fact that she's more popular than ever now. Mm. I mean, I got to go out and buy an action figure of her this year. <laughs> the, the only rotten part about that is Ms. Lion came along. Oh, <laughs> Ms. Lion. And oh, I don't open them up. So here the she is sitting on my work. toy shelf, my <laughs> special toy shelf now. And Ms. Lion is like grinning at me like, you couldn't get rid of me, could you? And, and I would have these, these, these meetings with, with our story editor. And who created that character? And, and he you know was, why he became story editor? Yeah, huh? Because you know why he became story editor? Because he he was, was the yeah, writer he, for that show. Yeah, he had some show that won an Emmy or something. It was a kid's show called Jamboree or some darn some thing. Some stupid thing like a kid never even watched it. And Stan had been asked to be a guest host on it, like he would on Sesame Street or something. Yeah. <laughs> and after that, he used this guy whenever he could because it was an in into Hollywood, and and. Uh, what was his name? Dennis Marks. Was Dennis Marks, like yeah. yeah. He was a good magician, too. He's yeah, a, he was. At the, at the Magic Castle. Anyway, he, um, we would have these meetings, and then he would say, okay, here's the way I see the scene, and I would describe the scene. First, I would describe the scene, you know, and it was very action or designed it. And then he would say, okay, Iceman does this, blah, 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 blah. Spider-Man does this, blah, blah, blah. And then Ms. Lion. <laughs> 
does this? And he would actually say it that way, you know? And um, He'd try to work her into the action, so she'd come along and do something that would save everybody. Yeah, take a leak or something, you know. <laughs> and she just never ran in front of a car, darn it, you know? <laughs> well, you know, we had a show in Chicago when I was a kid called Susan's Show. It was a live action show, and she had this dog, this puppy dog. And every single time they would get a close-up of that dog, it would lift up his leg and right in the food dish. It was, and we used to watch, because it was a sissy show, you know, we didn't, guys didn't watch Susan's show, but we watched it so we could catch those shots of the dog peeing, and that was. They actually put that on TV. <laughs> Yeah. That's Chicago for you, isn't it? Oh, Chicago. <laughs> I could tell you stories. Why, uh, why, why did they pick uh, Iceman and uh, Firestar well, to be the, the, uh, the amazing friend? Probably because kids couldn't turn themselves into ice, okay. you know. Right. And <laughs> it, 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 again, started with the, the Human Torch. They yeah. stand That's when we got Herbie the Robot. Human Torch be, be, be in there with Spider-Man, and then they'd find a, a female uh, character to do this with. And, and when they realized, oh, no, it's back to that old thing that the Human Torch kids are going to immolate themselves, you know. <laughs> but Firestar's so okay. So it became Ice, Iceman. But that actually was a good thing for us because I think Larry Houston came up with the idea that, well, then if he's a mutant, we can have Firestar be a mutant and we can bring the X-Men into this yeah. whole thing. Because we kept pushing him for the X-Men. That was, oh, that was I, a big deal. With, with I, did a, I, I half wrote an X-Men Yeah. because the, I won't say his name, the, the, the writer, I, I worked with him once. He was mostly stoned. And, 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 and you know, he would sit there on the bed. I tried to I work with him once on the hand of a... He, he just says that because he hung out with yeah. me. Yeah. Anyway, Dennis Mark said, you got you to gotta help me out. I can't give you credit on this, but I can give you money for it. This script makes no sense. You know, it was an X-Men. And I... I'm good at problem solving. That's one of my strong points. And I figured out how to make the whole story work. And Which I episode was it? The one with the juggernaut? Hmm? Was it the one with the juggernaut? It's the one about the junk, the jailbreak. Oh, oh, the jailbreak. The yeah. break. And, you know, because, like, for instance, there's no mention of any of Magneto having a, a headquarters or anything. And then suddenly there's, like, on the second to the last page of the original script, then from his headquarters... And he, where does that come from, you know? So I had to figure out how he was going to get into the headquarters, you know? And I figured, well, he's magnetic. He can get these pieces of metal flying from all, you know, and it puts it, and that would be kind of cool looking. And yeah, that would look good animated. And um, uh, what was my point? I was, <laughs> I was going to make a point, and then I kind of went off in a different direction there. But, um, oh, Dennis Marks, yeah. He told me once, he said, you think this is an adventure show, don't you? I said, well, yeah, it's not. I said, well, what is it? He said, it's a comedy show. It's a Bob Hope, Bing Crosby road picture show. It's Peter Parker is Bing Crosby, and Bob Hope is, Iceman is Bob Hope. That's what he said. And so he really took the, the character of Spider-Man and gave it to Bobby Drake, Iceman. I mean, the, the comic book, Peter Parker, and gave it to you know, the wisecracking characters of Bobby Drake, Iceman. But he didn't understand. When I brought in Submarine in these characters, he didn't know who those characters were. And I had to explain, you know. The problem for us was that we had Stan Lee there, and Stan was, you know, he, he could have been, he literally could have taken our side a lot of times, but he was at that point where he was just getting into Hollywood, he was being accepted because this network show had gotten bought, and that was a big deal at that point time because there were only three uh, venues for regular shows and that was NBC, ABC, and CBS and other than that there wasn't anything else it wasn't until the 90s when Fox appeared and then some of the other uh, uh, local sh uh, stations that were affiliated with others across the U.S. began to show cartoons and things really loosened up for us you know? and that's when they started showing anime shows and all sorts of stuff but at that point, you, you wanted to sell that show and keep it on the air as long as you could. And I know people who love it. I today talked to three or four people who came up to me and go, wow, that, that Spider-Man and his amazing friends and the Incredible Hulk show, those were you know, my jam during, the, uh, uh, you know, during my childhood. And I'm going, I'm, I'm glad I helped out. And they went, oh, it didn't, it didn't help me. It just, you know, I enjoyed it so much. 
And that, that's, that's nice to hear, because I even try to watch them these days, and they're really hard for me to sit through. They're, they're, I've done animation now for so long that I can see when stuff is really crappy. You know? and, and it's hard to go back and watch that stuff, especially mm. the ones that really knocked me for a loop are the Spider Friends shows, I mean the Super Friends shows, because they actually didn't care about huge mistakes that would end up on screen and they wouldn't do retakes. My favorite of which was constantly happening was, let's say it's Green Lantern talking to Superman, and Green Lantern would be talking here, and then he'd turn this way and talk to somebody over here, and then he'd turn back to Superman, but his mouth would stay over here, and it would be talking. <laughs> it's just like, those are the kind of things that are just unforgivable, you know? And, and those are the old uh, Filmation Super Friends? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, no, those, those, were, those were actually were fun shows, because they barely animated those. Right, right. The Teen <laughs> Titans and stuff, yeah, those were a lot of fun. No, this was Super Friends by Hanna-Barbera. Oh, no, okay. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. just they thought people didn't notice and didn't care. <laughs> of course they noticed. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I got to admit, it was kind of cool work, working with Stan Lee every day. Oh, it was. It was fun. You know, and... Uh, you were going to ask a question? He didn't take that much of, to my knowledge, in any active... Um, uh, no, he stayed out of it, Don. He, yeah. didn't, he didn't want to be anybody's enemy. He wanted I, to be Stan Lee. Yeah, you know, man. for a while I was writing in the scripts that I was... Uh, I, would have put a, I would make put Stan in as a character. I called it a st uh, Stan on the Street, like Man on the Street. And there would just be some, which is what he did in the movies then. Right. You know? And Dennis Mark said, no, you can't do that. I'm taking all those out. I said, why? He said, well, there's union problems. He's got to join Screen Actors Guild. And, yada, yada, yada. and the head guy that he's talking about, the writer, yeah. he did voices like the Green Goblin when that character came around. He just decided to do it himself, you know, because yeah. he was a member of SAG. Yeah. Hmm. So you were going to ask a question? Yes, sir. Oh, the show? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I feel my question, can everyone hear me without going up to the microphone? Can my teacher, my teacher voice working? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, you just said something interesting, how when you see, like, not good animation and you can't take away your attention from it. And I want to say I'm, I love Pride of the X-Men. I'm very upset that I've never watched it. It's something more than just that. That, that, was a, that was a true labor of love there. I love that. Yeah, I had a so much. I still have it on VHS. I it's a good show. It's, it's for great. a standalone. It, it came out really well. And talking about good animation, I'm curious to know what it was like working on what I still consider of all the cartoons I've watched in my life. Well, it's because we got Toy to do the animation for us. Right. This, this, is the, this is the this is a standalone <laughs> oh, that, that I, Will and Larry and I. I never at. I never got on that show. No, uh, it was once. It was a one episode thing trying oh, to sell oh, the X Men. Oh. But how did it feel to work on what is still, and I'm sure many people will agree with me, the nine best ad episodes of animated television. Oh, yeah. Larry Houston deserves all the accolades he can get for what he did with the X-Men show, because that was his doing. Will Minio and him put it together, and I, I was out of it at that point. I had moved to Seattle, and they called me to do the design, so I did the designs for the show based upon what Jim Lee was doing at the time, because they were really nice designs, and the, the, the stretching and length of the characters was very interesting. Um, but Larry took it over because Will went off to do Conan the Adventurer and one other show they were doing at, at Graz Entertainment at that point. Ouch. But Larry was very faithful to staying with the X-Men. He's, he's the reason it turned out to be what it is. And they're actually, he's, he's doing some stuff for the new show on Disney. He's, he's going yeah. to do, do the title el, uh, titles to the show, you know, do, at least board them and direct them. And I'm sure they'll get him doing other stuff too because he's just the figurehead of this whole thing. He's actually drawing comic book covers for the X-Men now. You know, he's, he's got a gambit that just came out, I believe, and, and stuff. And, and he li literally is the heart and soul of that whole thing. He was the guy promoting, putting other Marvel characters in the backgrounds whenever he could, not naming them in particular because they, they couldn't do that, but, uh, you know, call out their names and stuff. But they could show them like Thor flying through in the background or Doctor Strange Doctor doing something Strange. mystical. Yeah, exactly. And, and Larry just is, he loved that stuff. We all loved it, but Larry really just was devoted to it. And it shows, and it's paid off for him wonderfully, you know. Don't know if you can get that storyline right. <laughs> uh, Marvel's going to take a shot at a few of these things, I suspect. They, they're going to take it from where it ended, though. It'll be, it's called X-Men 96. That's a working title, but it could be the, the title to begin with. But it's literally going to begin right where the old show ended. Right. So it'll be set in the 90s and continue the sagas uh, all the way through there. No, I was making the point that between, like, Fox was not able to do the Phoenix storyline And they twi twice they took a shot, twice and they screwed it up both times. Yeah, I just hated <laughs> that. Those nine episodes are brilliant, so thank you, and you're proud of the X-Men. 
Oh, that's, that's, like I said, most of that's Larry, except for Pride of the X-Men, because I was lucky enough not to have an actual assignment when that came around, so I got to do a lot of stuff I wouldn't normally get to do. Uh, I, I storyboarded an entire sequence, the middle sequence of it, and I got to do all the voice casting, except for Wolverine. That, 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 Australian, <laughs> that, that Australian Wolverine supposedly came down from Marvel themselves telling, and, and the people at Marvel blame Jim Shooter, but knowing Jim Shooter just enough that I, that I know he wouldn't sabotage his own project, they told us that it was going to be found out that he was from Australia originally, and this is when you know Crocodile Dundee was popular yeah. and all this mm-hmm. nonsense. And so that's why I was stuck with that. But, on, but without that, we still had some beautiful stuff going on with the, 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 uh, the villains in particular and, the, uh, and, and Professor X, because I wanted a known voice for that. I wanted the guy, one of the two guys who had done uh, Benton Quest on the original Johnny uh, Quest. Uh, and we were able to get John Stevenson. The oh, first Stevenson. guy had died anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And John Stevenson was more than glad to do it. And when we finished the voice session, he came up to me and he said, it's the best adventure cartoon I've ever worked on in like 30 years. You know, he says, I just want to compliment you guys for what you're doing here. And I went, wow, that's exactly the reaction I wanted from these guys. And we got, uh, remember the guy who played the uh, psychologist in The Terminator? That he was a good actor. Oh, Earl, uh, yeah. Earl Bowen? Earl Bowen. Bowen. He, he was Magneto in that. Really? Yeah, a terrific actor. Boy, he did a wonderful Magneto for us. Just huh. great. It's a good cast. All, excuse me, all the way around. Very nice. Uh, is there anything uh, that you're particularly proud of? I mean, uh, s- avoiding anything with Miss Lion in it. Is there anything from these shows that you're uh, particularly proud of? Uh, you mean on, on that show? Yeah. Uh, well, I was more proud of things I wrote on the, the previous, the, the back sheet when we were doing, when we were doing the ones that were syndicated and not... Uh, I, I, liked, uh, I liked the one I did with... Um, not, the one with the Black Knight. Because it had some good, they sent the, the the animation over to Japan for that one. Oh yeah. Yeah, there was a couple and, episodes we got toy yeah, animation. Yeah, and um, so that was uh, one of my uh, favorites of the ones I wrote. My my favorite personal that I wrote were not on that show. They were on. There was one RoboCop I was really proud of called Rumble in Old Detroit, hmm. and I I it was a gang war thing, and I invented a since it was set in the future a street language for the punks, you know, and they talked to it, you know, and it, it just really flowed really nice. I did a um, DuckTales, that I, again, it was the duck and the iron mask, and that was, uh, uh, the animation was really good in that, you know, and the acting was really good. Uh, I, there was, even though I, I'm not proud of almost anything I did on Transformers, because all we were doing was making <laughs> half hour commercials to sell toys, uh, I did a couple two-parters that I thought came out pretty well because being a two-parter, it gave me a little bit more time to get into characterization, little bits of business that you wouldn't normally see in a half-hour show because they would be considered they just interrupting the action. You know, One was Dinobot Island, <laughs> and the other was um, Megatron's Master Plan. But then he did a half-hour one called Autobot Spike, which was based on Frankenstein, which I'm a big fan of, and um, and that was a joy to write. And those are the ones um, pretty much that, I kind of like the Tarzan too, because I really made it as Burroughs-like as I possibly could, and they let me use the, the Ape English Dictionary and, and all that sort of thing, and the Palodon language, and uh, uh, the, the Wazduns and the Hodons and all that, and, um, those are the ones I was the most the most proud of, I think. Uh, I think Spider Friends actually kind of, to me, got to be just kind of generic Saturday morning after a while. Um, but it did have that thing that we discussed earlier where we were able to show people that integrated Marvel Universe. And that, that, that I think, was the important thing about the show to a lot of us. And I think because we had opened that door, it forced guys like Dennis Marks to look at other characters that were out there that they right. could use, like Thor and Captain America and stuff. And I think it's, uh, it was an important step in a lot of ways, you know, because nobody yeah. else was doing that. Now, you know, looking back, I wish we would have used some of those 19, late 1950s, early 60s monsters that Kirby and 
<laughs> you know, like for t and tails. So it's oh, I agree. Googam, <laughs> son of Goom, who looked yeah. almost like his old man. You know, uh, Fin Fang Foom and Groot. I am, I am Groot. I just, he, I just uh, bought the, the collections of those. Those two collections they've got. The, oh, I love those. Those, <laughs> yes. those are some of Jack Kirby's best work. Yeah. They're just brilliant comic books. They're just really fun to read and just full of imagination and good artwork too. Yeah. Gorgilla. Remember Gorgilla? Name was a combination of Gorgo and Godzilla. Gorgilla. <laughs> well, they, they weren't always original, but they were funny. You know? <laughs> but most of those monsters were more realistic than anything you'd see in a movie. Yeah. yeah. We were stuck at that time with either reading a, a comic book that had a good monster and or seeing things like The Amazing Colossal Man or something, which are just wretched, those Bird Eye Gordon movies. <laughs> the only one he did that was good was The, the Magic Sword. You remember The Magic Sword? It was a really fun movie. Oh, yeah. The Magic Sword? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With Basil yeah. Rathbone and mm -hmm. Estelle Parsons. Or no, yeah. Estelle, was it Parsons? No. What's funny to me, and maybe even ironic, is that there's so much CGI in these Marvel, well, any superhero movies now. To me, they look like cartoons. No, they are. They're like high-tech <laughs> cartoons. So we've gotten back to cartoons. Actually, that's what's interesting about seeing the new Avatar trailer. I watched it. And I loved the movie when it came out. I thought it was a lot of fun, Avatar. But I've watched this new one, uh, this trailer for the new one. I went, oh my gosh, because of what we've got in all the other movies now, this, this is just a giant cartoon. It doesn't look real to me anymore. Because you can see some of the, you know, Marvel films. Let's, let's pick one of the really good ones, like, uh, like Endgame or Infinity War. And they're just stunningly beautiful and quite realistic in most areas. And when the, re when the animation isn't realistic, they're cutting well. So it's, it's just good filmmaking in most cases. I, I just think that we've gotten to that point where we're seeing stuff that's so realistic that like you and I may see mistakes in it, but the general audience mm -hmm. doesn't see that. But to me, you know, CGI looks like, you know, when you're, when you're uh, people who are older in the audience, when you're a kid and you went to the movies, and you saw this really crappy science fiction movie, you know, made by AIP or something, and you would nudge the person next to you, gee, I wonder how they did that. <laughs> well, now you know how they did it. It's some guy sitting in his mother's basement with a computer, and, and they, you know, and, and that's how they do it. It's all the same. I saw a movie on um, cable about three weeks ago called Deep Impact. It was about the... That's a terrible movie. Yeah, it was about a, a comet <laughs> that hit the earth, you know, and and wipe everybody out, and everybody's going into a panic and all. And when the destruction scenes came in, this is made right around the, right before Jurassic Park. So computer effects hadn't been really figured out yet. And it was all old school practical effects. Real water, not that phony water you see when it's flooding. That's in one the, of the hardest things to animate is water. Yeah, yeah. And it looked great. It was so, to me, I said, wow, that really looks like the world is getting destroyed. And it, it you know, I, I really miss those old effects. Yeah. I, I do agree. in some ways and not in others. I miss Harryhausen type uh, effects. Yeah. You, you miss what? Harryhausen type effects. Oh, like, yeah. You know, stop motion. But I got to admit, when I went and saw Jurassic Park, I was just thrilled to see real dinosaurs for the first time. That. Uh, literally, I, I, I had tears in my eyes when, the, when they, they showed the Brachiosaurus at the beginning. I just went, oh, my God, we were, we're finally here. We're finally at the point where real dinosaurs are on screen. That was, yeah. that was stunning. It didn't make a difference when they remade King Kong as much yeah. as Jackson had making the film, and the dinosaurs were wonderful. Yeah. It I, didn't have the heart of the original. Right. Yeah, I, when I was a kid, and to this day, I can watch a little clunky movie like Unknown Island over and over and well, over that's a again. Bad one too, yeah. You know, and, 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 and enjoy it. But some state of the art new dinosaur film comes on television, and I'm watching with one eye and doing something else with the other, you know. It, it's like. It's like they're all the same. You don't like Robo Rex and the Sharkosaurus versus Sharkosaurus? And I never thought, ever, when I was a little boy watching George Reeves as Superman on TV, and that was the only thing we had, that I would ever say, I'm getting tired of superhero movies. I and, really am. Uh, yeah. Not me. All, I'm loving it. I'm I, living uh, in, in the time I wanted to see when I was a kid. I, I, honestly, I am too. I mean, it's. I think for a lot of us, we didn't get that when we were younger. We didn't get the superhero movies that we wanted to see. So now we're getting them. But it, they're all the same now. They, well, I'm not. The, just, I'm not going to disagree with that. The last <laughs> act, the last act, the last half hour or forty minutes is nothing but CGI assault on your senses. You don't even know what you're looking at. 
because there's so much going on. And it all looks like to me like high tech cartoons. Yeah. You know, I, I really loved Black Panther until that last act came in. And oh, oh what, when's this going to end? You know, it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> but if you want to see some old school superhero movies, seven o'clock tonight. There you go. Seven. Wrinkles in the costumes. Well, that, well, that's trendy again now, wrinkles in the costumes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Any last statements? We've got a couple of minutes left. Larry Ivy, when he was making his amateur movies, he used to paint the costumes on his actors so there wouldn't be any wrinkles. Well, and then he would works. like, you know, put a guy in swim trunks or something, paint him blue, and then stick a Superman S on his chest, you know, glue that on or something. <laughs> and that was Superman with, and with a cape glued on. Do but any of you no know who Larry <laughs> Ivy was? Larry Ivy was a real popular uh, uh, individualist, uh, cartoonist, filmmaker. Uh, he had a great magazine called Larry Ivy's Monsters and Heroes that only ran, what, three or four issues, Tom? Monsters <laughs> and Heroes? Yeah, no, I, I, about three or four issues, I think. Yeah, yeah, and, and it was always very creative and stuff. Very interesting guy. All right, we're uh, winding down here. I got to let the next uh, group come in. So, right. Don, thanks for coming on. Rick. He's, he's still here, isn't he? He's, he's I think still he's still here, here yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm being, I'm being uh, whisked off, you know. Can I go out that way or should I go yeah, out We can way? go this way. It's okay. Fine. So. All right. See you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, folks. Thank you for listening. Hi, this is Maisie richardson Sellers, and you are watching Fandom Spotlight. Be a legend and hit that like button. And most importantly, have fun and follow your fandom.